Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Duncan Sparrow, and I'm a member of the Borderless Cyber Program Committee, and I have the honor and pleasure of introducing our next keynote speaker, Cassie Crosley. Cassie is the Director of Product and System Security at Snyder Electric, a huge global infrastructure provider. I know Cassie because she's also an active participant in the NTIA software transparency effort. Uh, one fun fact about Cassie is that she says she's, quote, born into technology and one of, was one of the first Silicon Valley babies, which makes me feel really old. Um, Cassie will be speaking on the product security risks and supplier trust in the supply chain. Cassie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Duncan. And thank you uh, for the Oasis organization and the ISACs for asking me to uh, keynote on uh, the wonderful sessions that you have today and tomorrow. Uh, my background is a long time in technology. I started out as a developer. So I have uh, quite a bit of experience on the software side and joined Schneider Electric almost 11 years ago as a PMO director for and what was at that time the Palco video line of business. So was introduced quite a bit on uh, the full product security uh, side and the product side uh, in addition uh, for the hardware and firmware. So I've had uh, quite a number of years experience in this area. Uh, I am very excited to talk to you today about what I am seeing and uh, I'm gonna be covering a lot of different topics. I'll be talking some technical areas uh, a bit. So if you have any questions, you know, Google or put it in uh, the chat and we'll try to address them. Uh, and if you have any uh, interest in participating in the NTIA SBOM effort and such, uh, definitely there'll be a link at the end uh, but it's uh, ntia.gov slash SBOM, but I'm going to be talking a lot more than SBOM today. So uh, especially for those that just came from Alan's uh, presentation, I think this will be a, an ex quite a bit of an extension of it. So let me talk about uh, how long can software code survive? Uh, Duncan and I were just talking about how, you know, we're, we're feeling a bit old. So back in one of my first jobs, I worked at Zsoft as a programmer. Zsoft uh, is no longer there, but they actually licensed the code uh, to Microsoft uh, for the first version of Paint. So I worked on, uh, at, first I worked at IBM as a co-op in, slash intern working on OS2, <laughs> long time ago, OS2 uh, 1.0 and 1.1 and then also on Windows 1.0. So I have been in the field a long time and Microsoft Paint, uh, even though it had a rework in 2005, I just want you to recognize that some of the code that was originally written by my bosses, Mark and Neil at Zsoft is still in the Windows platform today. Uh, so how long can code survive? Well, I can tell you that some of it can survive uh, over 30 years and just wanted to give that perspective because it's an important part of what we're talking about, especially in this community where you're working with critical infrastructure. Some of these components, uh, software, firmware have been around a long time. And I, I don't want you to forget that. Not everything is developed by startups and code written in the last 12 months. Uh, the majority of it is uh, there for quite a bit. So think of also the code over time. Uh, I just, uh, I know you're not gonna be able to see the specific details, uh, but in any particular software environment, you can have uh, over time, thousands of people involved in that, um, not just developers, but thousands of people. And part of this is we, uh, as code gets developed um, and continues to be enhanced and such, um, the amount of lines of code of software that's being developed is extraordinarily large. So if this long chart, like way back when, you know, there was 10,000 lines of code for Unix 1.0 and the average iPhone app is 40,000, but Facebook is over 61 million lines of code um, based off of this uh, report. 
and Windows 7 is about half of that at that time or two thirds of that. So just imagine all the different lines of code and all the people that were involved in creating that. Uh, and I, I, again, I want you to know that because it sets a bit of perspective. Um, sometimes when uh, I work a lot with our third party suppliers, which is why I'm having uh, the discussion here today, but also with our customers and explaining the differences between you know, a product that can be out there uh, for quite a bit. And I don't wanna really call it legacy, it's just longevity. Um, and then you've got things that might have been created um, uh, just days ago. Uh, so it is a, a long life cycle. So let me talk about that, um, that uh, life cycle in a moment, but in this space, of product security. So there's application security, uh, but I work in the field of product security, which incorporates application security. So I'm working every day with software, which it could be a cloud application. Um, it could be uh, the software that connects to IoT devices or IIoT devices, industrial internet of things. And then those devices uh, themselves could have firmware on them, or you almost always do have firmware on them. And that could be at the actual device level, but it can also be at the chip level. There could be hardware that has uh, software, which, you know, binary code, uh, which we would call firmware. So there are multiple different areas. So, you know, in this example, I know it's, uh, um, it's, it's, uh, a little bit smaller on your screen, but the chip that may control uh, the communications protocol may have its own code, and its co um, and that code is interacted with by the system itself. So there's multiple layers, and I'm going to talk um, just a bit about those layers and the product security risks that you might uh, need to think about in your world. So just wanted to give you that sort of framework. So um, before I go into the actual supply chain uh, piece of it, I want to just, I'm going to talk about this at the end um, again, is to me, the best way for you to understand your product security and your third party suppliers are two things, is to know who your suppliers are. And the best way to know that is by performing assessments. I think that anybody who's in this space has probably created questionnaires or have gotten questionnaires if they're a supplier from their customers. Uh, it's becoming standard um, line of business. And sometimes they're very similar because they're coming from a similar type of industry. And sometimes they're all um, over, the, over the place. A lot of those questionnaires, especially when they cover cybersecurity topics, were focused on IT security, um, which in the product security space is not truly applicable. So the questionnaires are starting to adapt where they're asking for how we build these. They wanna know about our supply chain. They wanna know what kind of standards we have in place. How do we bring our people up to speed? So I'm gonna talk, that's what I'm gonna be talking about in just a moment. Um, but uh, the next step is it doesn't stop there. You can ask the questions um, and I am surprised that people don't come back and ask for some more details um, because uh, really, in order to know your suppliers, you also need to know what you're agreeing to. And I, I personally um, uh, am working with a lot of uh, third party suppliers, you know, our, you know, where we're purchasing from. And once I understand who they are and how they um, do things, uh, I want to make sure that that um, those commitments are in the agreements, contracts, agreements, whatever term your company uses, um, you, as especially if any of those are in the government space, you know, the contracting process is long, but cybersecurity addendums and agreements are becoming uh, standard throughout the throughout the world of what are the commitments that your suppliers are giving. 
Um, so I want to talk about that again at the end. But what I'm going to give you is how you can look at some of the risks and what you, and I've actually in some of the future topics and I'll repeat this in a moment, but is I've bolded some items that you might want to consider making sure that are in your cybersecurity agreements that I think are important when it comes to suppliers. So that's where I'm that's where I'm headed. So, you know, what I wanted to talk about is, uh, you know, I love this concept that they talked about earlier in the uh, introduction, the kickoff for the event, is this borderless concept. Schneider Electric is a global company. We are headquartered in France. Um, our um, CEO actually lives in uh, Hong Kong. Our company is a $26 billion company. We've got 140,000 employees globally. Uh, we are to we call ourselves, you know, we're uh, local global. We definitely are focused on local and work uh, quite a bit um, in the U.S. side, of course, with Europe. Uh, there was the mention of this, too. I'm involved in all of that. Um, it's I, I just I love what I'm doing and I love the global nature. I've got a team spread around the world. I work with people every day around the world. Um, but that also means that my suppliers and what I'm thinking about is always on a global level. So I wanted to talk about these different areas in the life cycle of the uh, product security and third party suppliers and that um, because you know it to me it's uh, I'm always thinking about the overall perspective. Um, so I'm going to go through each one of these different concepts. Uh, on the left hand side, um, the first three items, open source, commercial, and proprietary. I'm really talking about the code, the binary, the ones and zeros. Um, and I'll be talking about the risks and, and such associated with that. Then you get into the environments, um, whether it be cloud or a specific environments. And over on the right, the last um, uh, four areas is after it leaves the development space, you know, what else do you need to consider? And this is not, I mean, this is just to me, you know, I, I'd say a partial view. Um, if I if I showed you all the different touch points, it would be quite extensive and take hours to go through um, because the life cycle uh, from uh, idea, uh, basically from birth to grave, um, from uh, beginning to end is so long and there's so many different um, uh, parts involved. Um, so I, I, I think that we focus quite a bit, especially at the beginning of this, because I believe this is a new uh, sort of in emerging space for, for many of you on the secure supply chain. Uh, but it doesn't, it's, it's not just limited to the developers themselves. You have the entire chain that I wanna talk about, uh, especially again, as it comes to product security. So what I'm gonna talk right now is about some risk reduction techniques, because I think that overall uh, risk is where we need to consider. Um, software development is not a precise science. Uh, as, as a computer science major, you know, while the basics and, and everything are still out there from when, you know, I received my degree, you know, quite a long time ago, uh, the tools, technologies, they, they change, but uh, the core of where we're going uh, is we want to do the best we can uh, and we are very reliant on people to start that uh, process and to do that development. Um, and when we're talking about people, we're, we can be talking not only about uh, developers, but I'm gonna be talking about some of the other uh, folks in the, in the development space, such as testing and such. Um, but when you're looking at reducing risk, I, I wanted to highlight a few areas. So on these, on these next couple tabs, uh, next couple slides. Anything that I have bolded, as I mentioned earlier, are good things to consider that you want to look at for assessments, but also to look at for what do you really want to consider in your agreements with your suppliers? Um, what information do you need to have? 
um, uh, what should they be doing as uh, best practices and such. Um, you are not uh, experts uh, as a software developer. You're not an expert in certain other fields. Uh, so leveraging groups that have that information about what to look for and what to consider, it's going to be really important. And then definitely following the guidelines. I'm uh, very you know, excited about the cybersecurity order uh, from, the, from uh, the US executive order because it really set the stage for putting some baselines in that in the industry, there's different baselines all around their standards and such, uh, but there were some gaps and um, being able to address those gaps uh, going forward by having that baseline set so we can all come to a, a common language, at least at the beginning. Um, certain industries will need to progress quite a bit further, uh, but I, I, I am really pleased with what's, uh, what's going to be coming out over the next year. So let me talk about a couple things that I think are very important in regards to the reducing your risk when it comes to code and libraries. Um, I wanna talk about, um, I'm gonna just briefly touch on uh, software bill of materials. Um, one thing that uh, I work with a lot is utilities and um, they are very interested in the software bill of materials. Uh, there are different aspects to it uh, that were, uh, you know, Alan then had some great information about PlugFest and the energy proof of concept that we have uh, uh, just kicking off. But the software bill of materials, I just wanna let you all know, it's, it's in its infancy in my uh, opinion, and I believe most of the others. Um, I am, as Duncan said, on the awareness and adoption. I do believe it's very important. It's very important um, for me to receive software bill of materials, the ingredients, from my suppliers, and I understand the importance of why uh, our um, our downstream uh, customers and end users need to understand what's in what's in our software. So um, I uh, I do believe that um, it will take time. So as you're working on any agreements, I realize that that's at the beginning stages, and um, uh, you know we're we're working through those processes. Um, H-bombs, um, Duncan asked me before, am I going to talk H-bombs? Hardware bill of materials, I think that um, anybody who has had a product that they've received, um, let's just say you, you bought a printer and you need to know at least a little bit about how your printer is put together because you need to know what ink to buy. Uh, so you have, you know, a product code or some information about that. Um, but you probably don't have the detailed components of how to service it. But for a lot of what we sell, um, it is important for, uh, for our installers and our service and maintenance for them to understand you know, that if this needs to be replaced or this piece, uh, that the hardware bill of materials is very important. And that includes um, where those components are manufactured. I think that um, anybody who's purchased anything, you'll see stickers on there that says, uh, you know, made, you know, in Taiwan or anything. Uh, but when you come to, uh, especially working with um, governments around the world, um, they're very interested in where those components came from. That we saw quite a bit last year, especially in um, different U.S. executive orders, uh, where the nature of where those um, items were produced um, we've seen some uh, vulnerabilities come out in the industry a few years back uh, with some, uh, uh, some compromised uh, chipsets and items like that. So hardware bill of materials uh, will continue to play a larger role. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, those components can have software in, um, as part of them, you know, firmware as part of them. So they have ones and zeros, they have something associated with it. So I do think that the hardware bill of materials is an important piece uh, to it. Um, one difference that I wanna bring out now about software bill of materials and hardware bill of materials is if you, you know, let's just say on an iPhone, you know, Apple knows exactly where the physical manufacturer of a chip is. Uh, the actual code that was created for that 
could come from different places. And that's why I wanna talk for a moment about open source, commercial and proprietary. You know, a chip itself or any kind of um, a platform or, or system that you put together, uh, let's just say um, not everything in most cases, over 35%, um, according to a uh, report, uh, over 35% of commercial code is has some open source in it. So if you are a company and you're all the every single line of code was written in house, we would consider that proprietary. So that's your proprietary code you've developed it in house. Um, if you're working with any protocols, any operating systems that come from somewhere else, but definitely um, it could be something that's standard based, um, or you could get some libraries that do certain functions. Those could be open source. Um, while I probably could tell you from a proprietary standpoint where that development group was located, um, uh, in in our you know example, uh, proprietary code, um, if it lives for a decade or more, that may change. You know, there are there are groups that change from location to location. You might have purchased a company; it could have been an acquisition, and um, you don't know the proprietary nature. But we know for sure that open source um, people can contribute to those open source. They can be anywhere. So when people ask, you know, where is your code developed? Uh, it can be everywhere. And I know that's not a comforting thought for a lot of people that. Uh, there could be developers all over the world, and there is that risk. Uh, but that is um, the nature of, of our basically open source communities is those contribution levels uh, so that um, the code can come in uh, to and, and be used and enhanced. Uh, and it really is um, an area that I don't think in true nature, if you're looking at uh, SBOMs or especially provenance, which I'll talk about um, some more, but just in the standpoint of, you know, who developed it, we do not know. Um, unless they provided all their details at code commit, I don't know if it's John or Sam, and I don't know if they're in Boston or Toronto or somewhere else. Um, that information is, is not, uh, especially for open source is not categorized and, and it conveyed, uh, you know, it can uh, be a, a complication, I think, that for a lot of people that are truly wanting to know uh, the confidence. So I just want to tell you the honest truth that it's a difficult topic um, that uh, I believe will complicate the whole provenance and, you know, where is really the country of origin. Um, in this whole conversation, especially as we move forward. And the last bit is um, commercial on that one is let's say you've purchased a library, uh, for example, a cryptographic library, or you've purchased an operating system that you're licensing. Um, you may be able to receive the software bill of materials, but having all of the details and in regards to their tools and the provenance and all of their developers, again, that's a very close system system. Uh, so having all that information for um, downstream suppliers. So for example, let's say an operating system uh, that you've purchased uh, commercially, they're going to have suppliers, they may have open source, they may have libraries. So I think that that's uh, quite a bit of challenge. So I don't want anybody to be uh, uh, um, uh, surprised here by uh, the uh, unknowns that you can see in this as we expand. So again, it's very different than I bought this piece of, of a chemical from this manufacturer to produce this silicon chip. Um, that's not how software and binary is developed or traced um, because there are humans that are creating all of this. So back to the risks, 
Um, I think we um, talked quite a bit um, on the SBOM piece about uh, having that knowledge about vulnerabilities. If you are working with a supplier, you do want to know about vulnerabilities. I'm going to talk just a bit about vulnerabilities now in the sense of exactly what Alan was saying earlier um, is uh, sometimes those vulnerabilities can be uh, diverted or uh, reduced or removed by setting compiles, um, by not including it. Um, I often see you know, that disclosure of all vulnerabilities. Well, if you've ever used a co static code analysis tool to examine your code, it could give you hundreds and thousands of false positives um, because it is just looking for um, that you may have this library um, and it has all of these vulnerabilities listed, but it has no idea how you've remediated it. So it's a difficult conversation at a contract level uh, because uh, it's really is where is the risk? What are, what are really exploitable? And in the world of especially um, uh, the critical infrastructure space, we want to make sure that the critical infrastructure is not uh, compromised by giving too much information uh, before something is mitigated. So I know I'm spending, you know, quite a bit of time on these couple topics, but I think these are the ones that most folks are less familiar with from what I've seen in the agreements. Um, so another area I've already talked about provenance is just really making sure that there's code walkthroughs being done. So if I'm taking in open source, you know, developers should be, I should be looking at the code that I'm uh, walking through uh, to make sure that uh, there's, I understand what's all there, um, uh, that I'm aware of what I'm including. Uh, I want to be using those tools that I talked about. There's different code analysis tools that'll look for vulnerabilities, that'll provide uh, feedback for improvements. And there's something called threat modeling. And if you're not familiar with threat modeling, I'm not gonna go into it here, uh, but it's, uh, I would say it's uh, fairly mature, especially from an IT system standpoint. Uh, there's uh, threat models on the IT uh, area. When it comes to, a firmware device or an IoT device, I I believe that is you know quite a bit unique, and um, uh, we are definitely looking uh, for uh, the industry to be able to share that. There, especially in the initial kickoff, they were talking about uh, where uh, I believe Scott was saying that we do communicate. We're working with our peers in the industry all, all the time. These um, ISACs are so important uh, so that we understand each other and we share best practices. So that is going on and one of which is threat models. Um, MITRE released a wonderful sort of uh, framework the basically for ICS on the attack framework. So um, it, it is continuing to evolve. One of the items that I really encourage you all to consider from a risk reduction is to ask your suppliers about their secure software development life cycle. Um, we are certified uh, in uh, what's IEC uh, 62443-4-1, that's the secure development life cycle. It's very much on the ICS space, the industrial control space. Uh, Microsoft has an SDL. Um, there are some other standards. Uh, NIST has the SSDF. Uh, it's not necessarily a control-braced framework, uh, but I do recommend you talk with your uh, suppliers about that. And then, uh, uh, you know, in, in incredibly important, but I see not really identified as well in agreements is secure testing practices. It's not all about development. It is about how you test, how you run through those tools. Do you create um, tests to validate um, that you've got secure requirements in your product, but that you also are doing um, items to the level of penetration tests. Um, we think a lot about penetration tests from an environment standpoint, uh, from an IT security standpoint, but penetration tests for uh, applications and products are extremely important. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's really something that uh, I think that 
overall, um, as your and we're working with a lot of uh, a lot of uh, U.S. government um, uh, affiliates and such, such as Idaho National Laboratory. The testing and certifications for testing, I think you're going to see evolve. I mean, decades ago, there was a lot in certifications and testing in regards to electrical standards and all of the standards uh, that you see from OASIS and such. Uh, but you're going to see a lot more of that. And we're seeing that on Europe side, especially, is what are those testing certifications um, uh, as we go forward? So consider it in your agreements. Uh, to look at uh, what is the supplier doing from a testing standpoint. Okay, next section of risk reduction is people build environments. Um, I, I just I have a few things that I want to bring up. Um, background checks. Um, we're we're very familiar with this. Anybody working in any kind of uh, government environment is familiar with background checks. If you're working with smaller suppliers, uh, they may not have that process in place. Uh, again, it's uh, something that I'm seeing generally uh, in this space of, uh, you know, on the government side, on the utility side. Uh, but if you're in an area that you're not working on that, um, background checks are important. We are working with, of course, uh, sensitive nature in, in this whole industry. Um, they, you know, if, if someone's writing code, uh, again, like I said, you're not going to know everybody, um, but those that are especially putting it together, that they're building those environments um, that are bringing things together, um, they have essentially the keys to the kingdom for a time. And so we've got, uh, we've got that area that we want to make sure we look at the people aspect of it. When you're actually bringing together all of those pieces, you've got code signing. Um, I consider that very important. Um, I think all of us do that are in this space. I just want to mention one thing, though, is if you're working with any um, components that might be older, even if it doesn't have a certificate or code signing, um, which is really saying, this is mine, I attest to it, we put it together, um, there are other ways to verify the integrity and authenticity of that. Um, and then on the right side, uh, when you're actually putting it all together, is the controlled access to those environments. I think that this area we all are fairly familiar with. If we've got some, you know, if we've been working with IT um, uh, service agreements in the past and risks, is making sure, you know, is it who has access to it and are you logging and monitoring in it? And so, again, in the executive order, it mentioned. The logging, it didn't mention the monitoring, which I feel is just as important, um, is the log gets created, but is somebody uh, checking that for alerts? Is there a process in place? Uh, so please be aware of uh, that as you go through. And on the supply chain, we've got, uh, again, a lot of uh, areas that you um, probably have already considered around infrastructure, uh, but I just wanna make sure that you're thinking about is the cybersecurity for the actual manufacturing sites, the um, whoever's producing the hardware and firmware, whoever's uh, receiving that. Not everything is in a tamper-proof package. I mean, some of what we build is uh, enormous, uh, and so tamper-proof packaging does not apply. But do you have the secure supply chain areas in place? Is there um, are, are the people trained in the proper cybersecurity uh, awareness? Um, is there verification and inspection? Uh, and do they have secure delivery processes? So again, in the bold, um, that secure delivery processes um, is important. And I just want to um, highlight on the right, uh, it, it's not just from the point of delivery, it's who comes to you after? Who accesses your system? Um, any kind of uh, project services for configuration, for working with multiple vendors, um, anybody who comes in um, in the second year or the third year to do maintenance and field services. Um, you need to consider that um, as part of this whole life cycle of the product. You're, uh, I see a lot of the agreements where they're, they're focused and then it sort of stops. 
Um, it, it'll talk about patch maintenance. It'll talk about um, that area, again, very focused on code. Um, you need to think about uh, what you're buying is going to be in your area for maybe 10, 20, 30 years. How are you going to maintain that and continue to level up with that from an agreement standpoint? And so last part, as I said, I would talk about it again, is doing the, by going through an assessment process, understanding your supplier, seeing where they are on this maturity as we continue to grow and expand is important. Um, maybe assessing them on an annual basis and then putting those agreements in place. And those agreements to me are, are almost living. I'm seeing in multiple cases where uh, it comes through uh, frequently where they're, because it's a learning uh, topic where we're still expanding and learning more about uh, where we need to concentrate. So seeing updated cybersecurity agreements is becoming fairly common uh, uh, from that nature. Uh, so if you just think about those two models, um, assessing and then agreeing, uh, it's, it's an important part of those processes uh, so that you can reduce those risks and really build that relationship. Um, people have been afraid to work about cybersecurity, but this is really important that you have uh, you have that continuous partnership and, and uh, life cycle throughout everything. And just a few references. Um, I, there's like a billion references that I could give you. But uh, the supply chain risk management template from uh, CISA is a really good one. Uh, definitely the SBOM. I mentioned the secure development life cycle and mentioned 4-1, which a lot of people may not be familiar with. It is a standard um, document that you do have to pay for, but uh, you know it is a, a nice uh, list of some of the controls of what you might want to look for. And I just wanted to mention this last thing is I, I've, I've written the supply chain chapter in a book um, that we're gonna be releasing uh, from the purple book community uh, out there in Q3, because I felt this is, a um, very important topic. So a lot of those risk reduction pieces that I've mentioned, I pulled straight out of the draft of that chapter that I've been writing for that group. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, I'm passionate about this topic. Duncan knew I was. Uh, so I just um, am so pleased that I was able to at least give you a few things to think about. Uh, so um, Duncan, did you have anything that you wanted to follow up? I didn't see any questions come over the chat. Well, first of all, thank you very much. Um, I actually did get get a couple privately just just to me. Right. Um, but first, I'm gonna well, it relates to one that somebody actually asked me about, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna enhance it a little bit um, because I'm particularly interested in secure development lifecycle. And you mentioned that um, the standard that you mentioned, which I don't happen to be familiar with, yeah. um, and I am more familiar with the IT side of the house than I am with the IoT or the OT side of the house. Could you give maybe a really brief what would be to the IT people? What would be the biggest sort of hey, you need to worry about this in in OT or or, or what, what's something to highlight a little bit how things are different? Well, I, I, I think that um, definitely the uh, IoT and the OT space, uh, the secure development is an important piece of the process, uh, but it's much more about the systems itself. Um, and it can get very confusing at, at a standpoint of those standards, because when you're thinking about a, a small device or, or just say a sensor um, in that respect, uh, it is not uh, at the level of, you know, uh, of what you have available in a phone or something of that size. You're working with a limited space and there are assumptions that it is part of a system. And so uh, there are a lot of um, thought processes. It's different than if you're, you know, an IoT device with a, a printer where you've got multiple parts of that system. When you're looking at a very small uh, uh, device sensor, very small footprint, uh, you do have to consider um, and really prioritize 
both being able to provide the requirements for the product itself to perform, but how are you going to secure that and in what infrastructure? So a lot of the, um, especially in the uh, in the IEC standards, it's got a level of product uh, where uh, product controls the 4-2 sort of set of framework of what it recommends. Um, and we also then have to consider this system itself. And we were actually a, a significant contributor on the IoT baseline that NIST worked on from that standpoint of IoT is not just a printer or a, you know, it's just a standard smart device. It's how do you consider the industrial IoT, which doesn't you know, usually have an interface. Um, and it, so there are a lot of, a lot of differences in that. So we did provide some uh, baselines. And I think that as, as other people might have seen if they're in this space, uh, we're, re we're really, you know, are there profiles of how to adapt and build those OT applications? Um, there's definitely, uh, besides the IEC organizations, uh, there are um, experts in NIST that are, are familiar with some of the profiles and especially in Europe where we're looking at some of the profiles. Well, great. Well, thank you again. This was a very wonderful talk. We'll uh, let everyone go to break now for a couple minutes and uh, yeah. you'll recall one of the topics that uh, Cassie mentioned on the country of origin, the, uh, the talk right following this one uh, is, is uh, very related to that talk. So people might wanna stay tuned for that next talk, but everybody have a great day and thank you. Thank you.